Welcome to the Migrant Resource Centre, North West Region Incorporated, Diversity and Disability YouTube channel. Your Life, Your Voice program where self-advocates and professionals in the disability sector are interviewed. The Diversity and Disability Project would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continued connection to land, water and community. We pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Nothing about us without us. We pay respects to all South Africans who have worked hard over the years and are still working tirelessly for their rights, supporting others with disabilities and human rights for all. This channel is for people with disabilities who aspire to seek self-advocacy role models to inspire change in their everyday lives. Nothing about us without us. Choice and control are central themes. Every interview is as unique as you and I. And it has a fundamental universal human rights ethos of respect for persons with disabilities, having their views heard and acknowledged. After all, it's all of the name, your life, your voice. Be, Be the, the voice, voice of change in your, your life. life. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Your Life, Your Voice. My name is Julie Skipper, so I'd like to welcome back my co-host, Larissa McFarland. Hi, Larissa. Hi, Julie. Um, yeah, it's uh, great to be back. It's been a while. Yes, so uh, Larissa had a bit of a break uh, to work on uh, a projects, other projects, and we're going to be talking about uh, the, a project she's, uh, Larissa, Larissa's been working on, which is about disability history and ancestry. Uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, would you like to kick it off, Larissa? Sure. Goodness, that sounds so professional. I have do and have a few PowerPoint slides. Don't know if they're a presentation yet. Um, uh, yeah, and I wanted... Uh, so I have I have been off because I have been doing some um, some other projects. Um, you probably I'm sure you know and our audience knows that I have um, quite a commitment to making visible disability pride and disability culture. Um, uh, making artwork about that and running workshops and of course it was Disability Pride Month in just last month in July. So I was busy um, running some workshops and presenting some artwork. Um, did you happen to see it, Julie, the work that was in Brunswick um, as part of the Next Wave Festival's Celebration of Disability Pride Month? I did not see it. I okay. saw it online, though. Uh, yeah. and I checked it online. It's, you know, I love your artwork, Larissa. It's, yeah, it's so um, pointed to disability, disability pride, uh, which is a very uh, interesting um way to view disability. Uh, I have my own um, my own challenges for disability pride and I, I, was thinking I, about, I, I was thinking about you Julie last night in preparation for this and um, I'm, you know it's like I'm always asking myself why am I doing this? Why am I why do I do this work on disability pride? Like it's coming up for seven or eight years and it's a lot. And um, disability pride is not easy. Um, and and the reason that I, one of the reasons that I'm committed to it is because not only do I actually think it is our best tool that we have for resisting ableism and gaining our rights, but I, it's also because I want to be better at it. I find it really hard. And I was thinking about you because I know that you have also expressed this difficulty with it, but you know, I've known you a really long time. And I think at the, when I first met you, which was around 2014, which was around the time that I was also going, it's trying to get my head around this disability pride thing. And, um, and I interviewed you at the time. And I remember thinking, wow, this is one proud disabled woman. Um, and so it, I guess it's a concept, it's a language, but we're all doing it ourselves. We're all doing it in our own ways anyway. So the idea of disability pride is just basically resisting 
those negative stereotypes of disability that are put upon us. It's resisting that discrimination, that ableism. It's standing up for our rights and ourselves. And I remember when I interviewed you, you were you described to me the ways that you had struggled and fought and to access education and employment and how you were very proud of that struggle that you and other things that you've been through. And for me, you are the demonstration of disability pride. Um, sorry, that was a little spiel that I wasn't planning to go on. But um, I think, I guess it's that, um, that's why I'm still working on disability pride because it is actually, it's, um, it is a complex, complicated thing. And I, I feel like if more of us practice it, then it will be easier for all of us. Um, yeah. Have I told you that the Disability Pride Month is actually 30 years old? No, I wasn't aware how old it was. Yeah, we're not really aware of it here in Australia. Um, it's starting to gain awareness, but July is Disability Pride Month and it first the first started in 1990, so over 30 years, um, with the signing of the Americans with Disability Act in July 1990. And uh, that's when it all started and that was the first Disability Pride um, March, I think. Um, yeah, so it's it's an international long-standing movement, but disability pride is also a personal practice. Um, and, and it's really born out of the disability rights movement and the social model, and, um, and it promotes that idea that disability is a human experience, that we're all really different, um, and disabled people are part of that diversity. Um, yeah, so more recently, um, I have been thinking, and maybe I will share my screen now because we can have a bit of a... a can, I just add, can I just add something to what you just said before you share? share right. screen? So we talk about this a lot where language is used against us. We're just talking about it off air, Larissa. And um, I am a proud person. And, um, and so... Um, so when, like, I'm being put down, these people are no longer in my life, the disability tag is added to that, you know. And, and so I've struggled a lot with disability pride and the concept, but I am challenging my, my views and I am proud, a proud person, a proud person in everything I do. So, um, and... Um, yeah, like try my best. So I think that when people try their best, uh, you know, that's all you can ask for. Absolutely. And yeah. We're all on a on our own journey to to self-love <laughs> and, and 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 healing the planet and you know being in a better world for everyone. But um I think um it's hard when we have experienced words used against us especially the word disability when it's used in a negative way about us mm. um, it's really hard for us to not internalize that and to then start thinking that it's a bad word um, and that it's a negative and it's really hard to undo that that's why disability pride is so important because it helps us undo that that negativity that's been placed on us and so we can reclaim back our words like that's our word how dare they, how dare people make it negative? You know, it's. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so all right. do you want to move on from that, Larissa? Oh, yeah, it's all the same, but you're right. Thank you. And um, feel free to jump in and um, uh, if I start going off on a tangent. So I should also explain that I'm also in week seven of a, a, a migraine. And um what I have learned <laughs> is that um, so I'm. It, it is quite hard for me to focus, and I do tend to um, go off on tangents at the moment. Um, it's interesting. Some people I know when they get a migraine, they just can't function, and I guess mine's maybe not as bad as that. But I also know that after twenty five years of living with chronic pain, we are really good at turning up and showing up and doing the stuff, even though we're in so much pain. Um, I mean, it, it means that later on things are really miserable and then I might be crying and screaming and not able to function at all. But um, I uh, we've learned to um, 
work through that work with our pain and I know I know people who've had held zoom meetings whilst in hospital in a hospital bed in between operations like we learn to do this because we can and um and 25 years for me that's a long time to practice um the only problem with this is it makes us very invisible um it makes our our, our disability invisible and then that leads to be not being understood or being disbelieved and dismissed. And it's okay, now I'm going off on another tangent. So I'll get back on track um, to sharing my screen. So yeah, feel free to jump in Julie with some questions or some thoughts um, or to get me back on track. Also time, because I'm not going to be able to do that either. Yep. I've, I've got the time, love you. Great. Um, slideshow. Uh, slideshow. Play from start. Um, okay. This isn't a relevant, well, it is, it is an important artwork, but it's not re particularly relevant to my presentation. But I did just want to acknowledge that um, healthcare is really difficult for disabled people to navigate. It feels like a maze. And this was a work I made just recently, that was the Commission for Disability Pride Month, um, to acknowledge that, um, that healthcare is pretty tough and complicated and hard to access. Um, okay, so I, I will um, start by saying the theme that I've been working with in recent times has been around practicing our pride, remembering our ancestors. Um, go to the next slide. So this is for me, I was thinking, where did this recent journey start? And this was in 2020. I made an artwork about Frida Kahlo. This is Frida Kahlo. She's um, undoubtedly probably the most famous female artist in the world. Um, uh, and, you know, most people are aware of her. Um, but what was interesting for me, whilst I was... I've always admired her work and her, you know, we, most of us know the story of how she had a, uh, this car, this tram accident, and she um, resulted in some significant injuries and she lived with pain and she made artwork. Her father built her like a, um, uh, a canvas, a, a set up where she could um, paint in bed. And, um, and so that's quite familiar to us. Um, and that inspired me as someone living with um, chronic pain and chronic fatigue and spending a lot of time lying down, wishing I had a father who could do that for me. Um, but um, it wasn't until 2020 that it suddenly occurred to me that she was one of us, that she was a disabled person. And I mean, she was, she actually had polio as a child and that resulted in um, one of her legs being much shorter and um different to the other so she walked with a limp um, and and then she had this horrific accident which resulted in you know some horrific injuries and and she lived with them for the rest of her life and ultimately died of them too um, but um why did I not see her as one of us um, and I realized that that's because history hasn't remembered her as a disabled person as a disabled woman um, and it made me realise that, I mean, history, as we know, is written by those in power. Um, it's, you know, the people who win the war get to write the history. Um, but history is often, as for the most part, has been written by um, white, able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual men, um, usually older, usually with a lot of power and a lot of money. And they're the ones who get to write history and disabled people are not important to them. And so we, our history hasn't been documented. Um, as much. I mean, it, it's harder to find. And so Frida really falls into that. So she's she's known as sort of a, a feminist icon. Um, she's very much been adopted by white feminism. And, um, and it's meant, I think, that parts of her history have been erased, like the fact that she was a disabled woman. Um, she was also a queer woman. Um, she was also Mexican, very proud of her heritage. Um, yeah, so I made this work to sort of reclaim her from history um, and reclaim her as one of us. Um, and this work is actually called An Accessible Future Has a Disabled Past. 
because I realised that how can we move forward and step into our strength as disabled people and and own our disabled culture if we don't um, have access to our history and if we can't, um, if we don't know our own cultural stories. Um, so I'm just, I have a few notes on my phone, so I'm just going to see if I, um, if there's anything else I want to add to that. Um, yeah, and so, oh, one more thing, yes, one of the things um, that I hold dear when I learned, when I started learning more about her was that she once held her exhibition opening from her bed. So they carried her bed into the gallery. And um, that is one of my goals, I think, in life, is I want to have an exhibition opening whilst in bed. Um, yeah. And um, this artwork, too, is trying to look at the complexity of all of us. So we're not just disabled. We're also, you know, mothers and sisters and scientists and artists and and some of us are white and some of us are brown and black and indigenous and some of us are queer or straight and you know we have different religions and different politics and um and they all define us and make us in different ways and uh so this background that Frida sits upon is also trying to point to this you know this complex I love maps so it is a map related thing but it's also the complexity of our lives and that we bring many different identities to the table to ourselves to the table when we when we enter a space um, and I've also chosen the colors of the trans flag um, here which is pink blue and white it happened to be um, trans awareness week when I was making this work so that really influenced me but it also is about the fact that um, the intersection of trans people and disabled people is very closely linked and overlapping and um, as, as all of our identities do. Okay, so um, that made me thinking more about this idea that our history is, um, much of our history is invisible to us and how this really impacts on our ability to learn from our past and move forward. Um, made me think about how I could explore more of our cultural icons, I suppose. Um, but it also made, made me realise that once I knew that just Frida was um, my one of our ancestors, part of our culture, it gave me strength um, and it made me think about how, how we practise disability pride. We talked just before that disability pride is hard. Um, it's hard to get your head around, it's hard to maintain, and that's why we call it a practice. That's why we do it um, regularly. Um, we do it because we often regularly find ourselves unable to be proud because the, of, the, um, of the impact of living in an ableist society, which tells us that disability is bad. We don't always feel that pride. And so that's why we practice. Um, and for me, I sometimes look to people I admire, um, to gain that strength. And it made me think, okay, I wanna make some work more about um, our recent ancestors, people who have recently died, um, so that as a way of practicing disability pride and provide an opportunity for other people to learn about their history as an act of disability pride. Does that make sense, Julie? It does actually, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. Great. So. Um, there's a series of six slide, six new liner cuts that I've made, which re recently featured in an exhibition, um, but they are also part of a mural in the city of Melbourne in the CBD. And I think at the end I might have a couple of photos of that um, in case you're not in Melbourne and you can't visit. Um, but I do recommend you to visit. It's a big mural. Um, anyway, so this is um, Auntie Gail Rankine. She is one of us. Um, she is a, she was, she was born in 1956 and she died in 2019. So just before COVID and such a great loss really. Um, and uh, she was a Nurinjeri woman. So she was born in South Australia at Point Maclay Mission on Lake Alexandria. Um, and she was really a really big leading voice for Aboriginal people with disability. Um, and in 2014, 
she, along with Uncle Lester Bostock, they, co they were the co-founding chairpersons of the First Disability, First People's Disability Network. Um, this, um, this organisation actually had been around a bit before that, but it hadn't, it, this was the year it sort of solidified and incorporated and, um, and started doing such important work. Um, in case you don't know this organisation, I recommend that you go and look them up and check out their website. Um, it's uh, not only is she, a dis, you know, a proud disabled, was a proud disabled person and a leading force in disability rights in Australia, but um, it's really important too that uh, we know the history of the land that we're on, the country that this great country we live in, um, knowing the stories of the first peoples and the peoples that came before us. Um, it's pretty, I will notice too that, say too that um, Indigenous people in this country experience disability at a much higher rate than non-Indigenous people. Um, and that's not because they're more susceptible to disability. Um, it's really as a result of the forces of incarceration. So the number of people get imprisoned and racism, colonialism, there's this legacy um, of where people have been disempowered um, through dispossession of their lands. And then there's unequal access to really difficult access to healthcare, um, to education, to housing, to so many things, which all impact our health and um, leads many Indigenous people to acquire disabilities um, at a much higher rate. Um, yeah, so Gail just didn't, didn't just hang out in Australia. She also um, represented Australia at the United Nations, both in Geneva and New York. Um, and she even became the inaugural chairperson of the Global Network of Indigenous People. So she didn't just work in the disability space, she was working in the you know, Indigenous space and bringing that disability perspective um, to this global network. Um, yeah, and throughout her life, she really drew a very strong spotlight on the high rates of disability in Aboriginal communities. Um, as I said, resulting from poor healthcare and nutrition, exposure to violence, to trauma, to substance abuse, and the breakdown of traditional community structures. It is, it is well documented of the, the lifespan of First Nations people is, I think last I heard is, 10 years less than uh, non-Indigenous people. Um, uh, yeah. The health outcomes and uh, the, um, you know, literacy diversity, um, uh, which, you know, our, one thing I've learned over the years is that learning our history is very important. And why is it important, you may say? Uh, you know, isn't it best to forget it? No, it's not. Because if we don't learn about our history, we're doomed to make the same errors. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's why history is so important. Yeah. Um, but can I ask you without, I don't want to be causing any um, shame or anything, but were you aware of Auntie Gail Rankine before I started talking to her, you about her? I I have seen this this portrait. You know, you've seen um, it because I've made it. Uh, because yeah. I'm pretty sure I've heard of it. I've heard about her. Okay. Um, I mean, I probably first started talking to you about uh, a couple of years ago, um, mm. but I wasn't aware of her. So um, if uh, that's great if you did, but I, I it, it through my investigation, I was really shocked how many um, amazing disabled women. I focused on women leaders because you know, fed up with men at the moment, but that's another story. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I actually was um, was shocked how many I didn't know. And that's partly why I started making the series of work because I wanted to make visible this history that most of us don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sure that within our networks, there are uh, also our um, current leaders you know, of Indigenous peoples. Um, so, yeah, so maybe down the road, Larissa, you could do something around that. Um, <laughs> I could. So um, I should just 
lows here that I deliberately chose um, uh, as my subjects for this um, series, um, people who have died. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Because... Um, because I think, you know, sometimes when we die, we don't remember it. Um, but also that, um, uh, yeah, I think to choose living people is more difficult. I've made work about living people. And I think sometimes that's hard because um, people want to know why it wasn't them. So uh, I think we're living in a time at the moment in Australia, pro exacerbated by COVID, where we are struggling we, there's a lot of competing with each other, limited resources, not just in the disabled community, just generally in the human population in Australia. We're quite competitive and uh, this feeling of scarce resources and, um, and part of making this work for me is trying to find a way to bring us together um, instead of competing with each other. And so previous work I've made, um, sometimes people have put out that I that they didn't, I, I didn't invite them to be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to invite everybody to be part of my world. But obviously that's impossible because, you know, I'm we're just I'm just one person and I'm already struggling with energy. So um yeah. So if in case you're wondering, these are women all are dead and um and I did choose that. Um, I, I was well, I do know they were all deceased. Uh, and uh, look, I'm not a, well, some may differ, to, differ about this, com this next comment. I don't think I'm a very competitive person. Uh, so I look at, you know, the um, human, you know, culture and like the, our, our complexities and like all that sort of stuff. So I, actually do come from a very competitive family environment and yeah so for me it's yeah I do understand why and your reasons why um you chose these these subjects uh and um you are right um in, in a way uh once people are deceased um you know, um, it's a bit of it's a bit of a shame if their history wasn't documented. So, good choice of 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 uh, topics and subjects. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, it's just uh, it's mostly just to protect me. Making artwork about people is complex and complicated. There's a lot of ethics involved and uh, moral issues to think about. Um, in fact, you know, even making this artwork was really complicated because I'm um, creating a picture of a deceased. Aboriginal Indigenous person and that is a um you know in traditional culture you don't mention the name or show photos of deceased um, people um so for each of the portraits I created I gained permission where I could um to do this work and um yeah from the families and um people so Art is actually a lot more complicated than it looks like when you hang a work in a gallery. Um, there's a lot of protocols and um, cultural issues to think about. Um, yeah, um, including one of the images, um, which I'll come to, I ended up having to buy, pay, pay 300, I think three or $400 to the Herald Sun uh, which it, which uh, was complicated and difficult and annoyed me because I really don't want to give the Fairfax Media or whoever it was, the Murdoch Press, I don't know, whoever it was, I didn't want to give them my money, but I needed to to just tick all the boxes um, because there's all these rules around art, which I won't go into because that's really boring. So um, do, do we need to put a note on our comments um, uh, sections uh, indicating that um, there are images of deceased Indigenous people. Um, I reckon that's not a bad idea, um, but let me think on that. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go on to, um, this is Leslie Hall. So uh, she's probably the most well-known, oh, no, one of the more well-known women in my series, but she's still really unknown to lots of um, people. Um, 
She born in 1954 and she died in 2013. She was uh, a Melbourne girl. Um, she was a feminist, a disability advocate. She was a leader in the workers' rights movement and also the disability movement uh, since the 1970s. She trained as a teacher um, and then she worked in numerous community and arts organisations. In fact, before I had my disability, um, she, I knew that she worked at my local council as the arts officer. I didn't know her, I just remember her name. Um, she also was one of the founders of the Women with Disabilities Feminist Collective, which then became Women with Disabilities Australia, also known as WIDA. Um, uh, and she also was the CEO of the of Australian Federation of Disability Organisations um, up until her death. She, um, and that organisation still goes to dates, um, worth also checking them out. Um, and she also really did a lot of research in creating the national, um, well, she did, she established the National Disability and Carers Alliance and also in the formation of the NDIS. Um, I'm not sure what she would think of it today. I'm sure she would have be angry and shouty because, you know, she'd be doing something about the NDIS. Um, but back then, the NDIS was going to be something quite different to what it is has turned out to be. And she was um, did a lot of work there. Um, this, um, this artwork is actually taken from a photograph that was taken in 1981 at the St Kilda Town Hall. So Leslie was a big um, passionate advocate and activist against beauty pageants. Um, and this is from this famous photograph of when she did a protest at the Miss Australia Quest pageant in St Kilda. So she very much um, drug or, you know, opposed this contradiction, this really this inherent contradiction in events like this that were raising money to support children with cerebral palsy. So it was run by the Spastic Society. And yet it also then objectified this idea of um, physical perfection. And of course, you know, this beauty pageant did not allow disabled women to partake. Um, I'm sure it was just white, blonde, beautiful women um, back then. Um, yeah, and so Leslie was like, why can't I be involved? And, but no, she wasn't. So instead, um, she organised a bit of a protest. They made signs and she stormed the stage with this sign. Um, obviously... <laughs> She got can, I just add, can I just add something to this, something quite personal, actually? Someone I know was a contestant in the Miss Australia pageant back in the, would have been in the uh, well, late 60s. And even before I knew you, Larissa, or maybe I did know you, um, we had this conversation about, 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 the uh, the pageant and how the 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 uh, they, the uh, organisers of this pageant only allow children children to be a part of the um, the Miss Australia Quest and they didn't allow like older children or you know that you know so they, there was this play on you know uh, cuteness and 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 you know, this, you know, this pity type of mentality. And um, as you, you and I know, Larissa, we have lots of people in our network who are adults who are really proud cerebral palsy, who have cerebral palsy. And uh, one of them is our manager, Christian Astoria. So, you know, so um, it was really interesting. Um, this person, I like, picked that up, like, you know, like decades ago, you know. So there were only selected, people were selected based on, probably based on, you know, how much pity they can evoke from people, I'd say. So I don't like the pity pity card. Uh, you know, I really am against that. So, yeah, uh, what are your comments about but yeah, so um, the charity model of disability is quite closely aligned with the medical model of disability, and both those models are very, they're very 
present today in our society, um, which is why we practice disability pride to resist them. But yes, the charity model is that, you know, we should be grateful. Disabled people should be grateful for what they receive. Um, and the charity model, I mean, it still goes today. It's, it's uh, next month is September, or well, sorry, it's se September, but the cerebral palsy um, people, you know, organisations which aren't disability led have decided it's September, which is a month where um, well-meaning non-disabled people run up and down stairs and uh, raise money for disabled people with cerebral palsy. The irony or the discrimination or the ridiculousness of it is that um, often people with cerebral palsy can't walk upstairs. So you're excluding the very people that you're raising the money for. And it's it's, that's why there is now a slogan that says piss on pity. Um, it's a, a human rights, disability rights slogan that's been around, you know, as long as I can remember. Um, and it's designed to go, no, I'm not. This is a stupid charity model that objectifies and demeans me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if next time if you as you enter, enter September and somebody comes up to you and says, oh, I'm doing September. Don't just take it on and go, oh, that's really nice. I mean, they're probably well-meaning, so I'm not saying have a go at the person who's doing it, but it would be worth a conversation to, um, to let them know that this is not a disability-led initiative and it's not one that disabled all disabled people support. That's, that's a good point, Marissa. Yeah. Do we want to move on? Well, I will, but I want to make one point about this artwork. So obviously Leslie was ahead of her time because, you know, she's storming the stage in the 1980s. Um, but this sign um, got her, got me and her into trouble. Um, so she's used the SS sign as part of her. Oh, um, yeah, I can see that, yeah. Poster. Yeah, and um, uh, we believe that she did that um, because to point to history. So the first millions of people that were murdered in the gas chambers um, or by other means in Nazi Germany in World War II were disabled people. Um, before the Jewish people were murdered, it was disabled people. And I think then it was um, gay and queer people and, um, and gypsies and also Jewish people. So, I mean, yeah. And there were millions of disabled people who died. And so I think that that's why she's using it. What made it complicated for me is that I've been putting this work went into public space um, several times in the CBD. I blew it up really big and I um, installed it in spaces um, in, in the streets. And it because we're very sensitive about Nazi symbols, um, this artwork was reported and removed, um, which is really interesting um, because the point of Leslie's stance is to actually point to the discrimination of the of the Nazi Party, um, but instead people uh, can't see that history, and instead they think this is offensive. So it's been a complicated process, and I was able to install it in the final mural, uh, which is in Royal Lane in the Melbourne CBD, just near the Burke Street Mall and near the Town Hall. Um, I was able to put it in. Um, because the Melbourne City Council put a disclaimer on their website about this artwork, which protected them and meant that they uh, didn't have to remove it. Um, that's just a little bit of an insight into some of the complexities of making artwork. Look, I don't know, like, I don't know much about art. I, don't, I appreciate art. I understand art to a degree. But I know that we, when you go see an art exhibition, as I went to see yours in uh, Sunshine um, a few months ago. Uh, you have like explanations of your artwork. And I wonder whether that's a way to like um, to explain the artwork, whether that could be added to your artwork. Um, oh, I don't um, I don't have a problem with um, uh, Leslie's depiction of using history and this and the Nazi party. Um, this is more about um, institutions like councils, governments, that they, there's a lot of um, rules and regulations and risk management and fear um, yeah. that they work within. And 
uh, fortunately, as an artist, I I just if I work with them, I have to follow. I have to work with that, but I don't need a disclaimer myself. And anyway, that's what I'm doing right now is I'm explaining why she used this. Um, sure. And yeah. um, even when we interview certain, certain groups of people, we need like go through lots of different hoops and stuff. So yeah, and that's fine because they have to protect themselves. Yeah. So um. Yeah, so anyway, so Leslie was um, a very powerful woman. And and I think that, I mean, all these women are amazing, but this one, this really, because what I realised is that um, over the years, I didn't know Leslie well, but I did meet her. She worked at Ross House. And so, you know, we'd pass in the corridor. I, I was working there too. Um, and she did come and give us a talk about, Human Rights, I think, the, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of um, People with Disability, which she'd worked on. And um, so she was fierce. She was a bit scary, actually. But, gee, she knew so much and she was so articulate. And I, um, when I'm feeling, uh, I don't know, afraid to speak up or if I have to go to an important meeting and I know that I need to speak up about disability rights, sometimes I would channel her. Like, like I'd go, what would Leslie do? What, how would Leslie deal with this? And I knew what she'd do. She'd just walk in and, you know, open her mouth and be really strong. I'm not Leslie, so I would, you know, channel her a little bit and try to bring me in there as well. Um, uh, but, geez, I wish I could do that. Just be fearless and offensive and oh, be wonderful. But, um, but I'm a bit too sensitive for that. Um, anyway, I. I wanted to share this with people that you too can um, can channel or can look to your ancestors to bring you strength. I mean, another thing I'll say about this time, this the 80s, 1981 was actually International Year of Disabled People. Um, and so there was a bit of momentum, you know, for the first time there's an international year. There was a stamp. Of course, it had a, a white, you know, disabled man in a wheelchair. But, um, but that was the time. Um, and 1981 was also, there was an international conference convention somewhere in the world, probably New York, I'm not sure, um, of disabled people. And the Australian government funded for people to go to that, but they only funded men. And I bet you they're all white men. Um, so women weren't allowed to go. Well, they were allowed to go, but they had to like pay themselves, they had to pay for everything themselves. And of course, you know, disabled women don't, aren't, most of them aren't made of lots of money. Um, so they, a group of women, including Leslie, um, I believe, and another woman we'll see later, Margaret Cooper, um, I'm pretty sure that they got together and, you know, fundraised and got themselves to this conference where they weren't really allowed in because they weren't officially representing Australia. Um, but it then that's what led to them going, okay, we need to develop a women, a disabled women's network. Um, a feminist network that is a, because women are being excluded and the government is contributing to this. Um, as we know, this is still going on today. You know, we know that the NDIS, for example, only um, the stats are that only 37% of participants are women. And that's not because less women have disability. It's just that women are still through the forces of sexism and patriarchy as, and, and other forms of oppression. We're still being excluded from our spaces and our rights. Um, anyway, that was 1981. And I suggest, um, I encourage you to go and look up Leslie and um, find out more about, about her. Shall I move on to the next one? Yes, please. Okay. Um, should I speak less? Because I haven't got any concept of time at the moment. Um, well, we have, we have about... Um, my math is not good. So, how about I go and then you can tell me when? Just go and I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. So, this is Laura Hershey. She is the uh, non Australian in this group. Um, as you can see, born 1962 and died in 2010. I she was an, um, a poet. She's from the US. She was a poet, a journalist, a speaker, a feminist, and disability rights activist. Um, consultant. Um, she also worked in violence prevention, which Julie and I both do as well. Um, and um, she 
was a powerhouse. Um, she really changed my life in around 2014 when I first discovered this thing called the social model and with it disability pride and then I suddenly was able to make sense of you know the previous 16 years of confusion about why am I a bad thing um I it started to make sense to me and I then had a way to understand why people think disability is bad um and so she wrote a poem called you get proud by practicing and this really revolutionized the world um, of disabled people. It was written in the 90s and I went on to, um, you know, create copies and make artwork about it, paste it up in the streets and tell people because um, it really focused me. And I'm going to read this poem in a minute because I think it's really important. Um, she also, um, she was one of Jerry's kids. So we talked a little bit before about the charity model. Um, Julie, do you know about Jerry's kids? Uh, it does not ring a bell. Okay. So um, the Jerry Lewis, a famous comedian in the US, who I think might have died during COVID or maybe, anyway, he's definitely very old. Um, he, he used to run a telethon, so basically um, a fundraising activity um, for the Muscular Dystrophy Association every year. And his way of doing it was to, you know, you talked about, was to parade young children, young, pretty, gorgeous little children who have CP, cerebral palsy, or some, no, have some muscular dystrophy um, condition, um, but look gorgeous. And he'd parade them out and, you know, use them to raise money. These kids grew up to be adults and they were like, hang on a sec, what are you doing? Um, and this is not right to be using me, to be objectifying me, um, to raise money and I suspect not all that money went there. Um, so anyway, she grew up to be one of the leader of the protests against these telethons. I didn't know this. I knew all about Jerry's kids and the telethon protests, um, but I am embarrassed to say that I only learned that Laura was part of it um, two years ago when I started doing my research. Um, so yeah, they, um, they protested against trying to stop this telethon and just because the ways they portray people with muscular dystrophy as, you know, as pitiful um, and as having lives that aren't worth living. And these adults knew better. Um, so there was a protest in 2001 where she actually was arrested um, because she parked her wheelchair in front of a bus. Um, and she uh, obviously was very proud of that. I'd be proud of that. Um, so, but she also crossed many areas so she didn't just work um uh around you know protesting against um pity and the charity model she also um was an activist around employment education queer identity violence and abuse um she actually set up a an organization called the initiative um in colorado which was around preventing violence against women with disabilities um yeah so um, oh, and I've got a quote here from her. Our disabilities may impose limitations, but physical, economic and political barriers impede us far more. So that's what many of us say, you know, yeah, sure, we have bodies that are unruly and can be in pain, and um, but our biggest barriers are actually the attitudes um, and the barriers in society, the physical barriers, and there's attitudes that tell us we're lesser. Yeah, sure, dealing with chronic pain is really tough, but I feel like I could do that and I could do it so much better if I didn't also have to deal with um, the barriers that I have towards healthcare or towards employment or all those things. Um, yeah, okay. Are you ready, Julie? I am ready. We have about uh, 13 minutes. Okay. Well, um, I can go on and talk about the other three women or I, I think I'm going to read the poem because I don't think it will take that long and it is such an important part of our cultural history. So You Get Proud by Practising by Laura Hershey. 
If you are not proud for who you are, for what you say, for how you look, if every time you stop to think of yourself, you do not see yourself glowing with golden light, do not, therefore, give up on yourself. You can get proud. You do not need a better body, a purer spirit or a PhD to be proud. You do not need a lot of money, a handsome boyfriend or a nice car. You do not need to be able to walk or see or hear or even use big complicated words or do any of those things that you just can't do to be proud. A caseworker cannot make you proud or a doctor. You only need more practice. You get proud by practicing. There are many, many ways to get proud. You can try riding a horse or skiing on one leg or playing guitar and do well or not so well and be glad you tried either way. You can show something you've made to someone you respect and be happy with it, no matter what they say. You can say what you think, though you know other people do not think the same way, and you can keep saying it, even if they tell you you are crazy. You can add your voice all night to the voices of 150 others in a circle around a jailhouse where your brothers and sisters are being held for blocking buses with no lifts. Or you can be one of, one of the ones inside the jailhouse, knowing of the circle outside. You can speak your love to a friend without fear. You can find someone who will listen to you without judging you or doubting you or being afraid of you. And let, your, and let you hear yourself, perhaps for the very first time. These are all ways of getting proud. None of them are easy, but all of them are possible. You can do all of these things, or just one of them, again and again. You get proud by practicing. Power makes you proud, and power comes in many fine forms, supple and rich as butterfly wings. It is music when you practice opening your mouth and liking what you hear because it is the sound of your own true voice. It is sunlight when you practice seeing strength and beauty in everyone, including yourself. It is dance when you practice knowing that what you do and the way you do it is the right way for you and cannot be called wrong. All these hold more power than weapons or money or lies. All these practices bring power and power makes you proud. You get proud by practicing. Remember, you weren't the one who made you ashamed, but you are the one who can make you proud. Just practice. Practice until you get proud. And once you are proud, keep practicing so you won't forget. You get proud by practicing. That's a very powerful um, poem. And I could identify with a lot of that poem um, coming from a cold perspective, cultural and linguistically diverse. How many times have I heard, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you know. And um, I just kept practising. Um, and I kept on practising and breaking that stereotype within my uh, culture. Yeah. Yes, so it, 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 it takes one person, you know, to, and that, let that person be you to, to make your life a better, a better life by practising. Yeah. And by practising, we also demonstrate to others that they too can practise um, practice being proud, practise disability pride. Um, so it makes it easier for others. So Laura's made it easier for us by the work she did. Um, I, I'm going to say too, I, uh, I can't see myself at the moment because I've got a slideshow on, but I'm imagining you can see me and I'm pointing to my um, one of my badges and I've actually taken the last few lines of that poem. Remember, you aren't the one who made you ashamed. And I've put it onto a badge and I, I wear this to remind me that the shame belongs to society. Um, mm -hmm. Society's attitudes to disability are negative and the shame is not my shame. It's society's shame. And I'm going to put it back there. 
I'm not going to take that on. I'm going to be proud of who I am. Hmm. I've had to deal with lots of issues, still a bit shame yeah. uh, and lack of resources directed to myself for health care. And uh, I wanted the, I, I consider myself very, very um, fortunate in that I had the strength to fight and I had the strength to like move on in life. Uh, which was not e not an easy life um, because I had to basically support myself probably from the word for birth, I'd say, to, to a lot of degree. Uh, yeah. so, Sorry, go on. Yeah, so um, that's a, yeah, it's a common, a common story and, and I'm not saying that getting proud is easy. Just like Laura Hershey said, it uh -huh. is not easy, but it is it is the better path. Um, it, it, having gone through the all the all the ups and downs, a lot of downs, um, I would encourage people to challenge their their lives if they feel like they be they're not listened to or funded or you know recognised in the family environment. That you know you can get out there and and and. Uh, be whoever you want to be. Okay, so I'm going to um, interrupt you because I want to yeah. get through the last oh. three women um, because our, our, our elders. So this is Margaret Cooper, another Melbourne girl. Um, she born in the 1943 and died again just before COVID. Um, she was very involved with disability and women's activism from the 70s. Um, I mentioned her before, she would have worked with um, Leslie Hall in the 80s to set up the um, Women with Disabilities Australia. Um, and she, she was very committed, as were actually all the women, um, to disability-led organisations. Um, we still don't have enough disability-led organisations in Australia, in my opinion. Most are run by non-disabled people. It is changing slowly, um, but it's... Uh, it's been a really long fight. Margaret was talking about it in the 80s. Um, she has a lovely quote. There's, I found a lovely quote that she said, um, which I will read to you now. It's very short. We should never forget our past history and remember it with horror and be proud of our survival and at the changes we have made. And I think that really sums up a lot of my work or what I'm trying to do too is like... Um, uh, I don't want to dismiss, um, I want us to learn about a history and I don't want us to dismiss the, um, all the, one, all the, the, the fight that we still have ahead of us, the people who are still being discriminated against, who are still living in institutions, who are being abused. Um, you know, that is still going on today. But I also, I want to balance that too with being proud of our survival. Um, okay, I'm moving on. Um, this is Daisy Sarong. So I did know Daisy. Um, uh, Daisy was, um, so I grew up in the self-advocacy movement in Victoria. So that meant that I was hanging out with people with intellectual disability and brain injury. And uh, I heard um, lots of stories of people um, surviving institutions and fighting to close them down. And one of these was Daisy. Um, she, she was very active in the, in the self-advocacy movement, um, advocating for the rights of people with intellectual disability. Um, she was actually taken away from her mother at the age two, age of two, and she was put in an institution. Um, and she lived there for almost 40 years. Um, she lived in a place, I think it was initially called the Sunbury Asylum, and then it was the Sunbury Mental Hospital, and then it was Kalula Training Centre. Um, and so she spent most of her life there. And these were not good places. Um, but this was the fate of um, many uh, people with intellectual disability, people with mental illness, um, people with uh, uh, who are nonverbal, people with a um, great amount of physical disability. They often ended up locked up for their lives in institutions. She managed to get out in the 80s. Um, and she then went on to support other people who, when they got out, to adapt to this new life of freedom. 
Um, imagine that. But she also got together with other intellect people with intellectual disability, people with Reinforce, who some of you, may, our audience may be familiar with, um, one of the longest running self-advocacy organisations for people with intellectual disability in Australia, possibly the world. Um, but yeah, she, they worked to close down some of these institutions. And I think this one was closed down in 1992. Um, not saying it's, unfortunately, when they closed them, they didn't really create other support areas. So we're still in a bit of a, a mess. But anyway, um, she was amazing. Um, and I really wanted to include her because uh, our audience may know, and I'm sure Julie does, that often people with intellectual disability don't get to be involved in things, don't aren't part of the story. Um, there's still a lot of segregation and um, their history, their, their stories aren't remembered either. So of all these women that I've presented to you today, Daisy is the only one that really doesn't have a presence on Google. Um, when you Google her name, there's pretty much nothing. So I, I intend to make a Wikipedia page for her um, and for the other women too, because they all deserve one. But I think that she, while she did so much, it's part of that underlying discrimination that we have against people with intellectual disability that we don't think their stories are important enough to record. Um, not you and I, but just, you know, culturally. Um, yeah, there is a, another, sorry, do you want to say something? A couple of years ago, I interviewed Hulk Hulk Hesco, who yep. was part of the, say, um, Daisy's um, uh, uh, era, uh, who campaigned against closing down the Sunbury um, institution. Yeah, that's right. And it's great that um, that you are including people with intellectual disability in this YouTube. Um, yeah. All right, I'm going to move on for sake of time because I would just love here to sit here and tell you more Daisy stories, um, but I won't. Um, the last one, oh, well, she's um, uh, she's probably the most well-known here in Melbourne of this series, and you, um, I know that um, you, Julie, did a bit of a special on Stella, and I think last year we also did a bit of a special on Stella. So um, she deserves, deserves all the specials. Um, as we know, she was a writer, a journalist, a comedian, uh, an activist. Um, she, uh, she grew up in Stall, um, but lived in Melbourne. She, was, uh, she had a condition which she called dodgy bones, um, and she called herself a crip. Um, she was a proud crip. Um, she worked at um, many different things. She actually went studied to be a teacher. My sister actually was at uni with her. And then she worked at the Melbourne Museum and she was the editor of the ABC online platform called Ramp Up. And geez, I wish we still had Ramp Up today. Um, it was this amazing platform of disabled voices covering disabled art and culture. Um, and I wish it would come back. And of course, she made the um, the the now world famous TED talk, I'm not your inspiration, thank you very much. And that's where she made the term inspiration porn famous. And if, you're, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I highly recommend you just search TED talk and Stella Young, and that will um, there'll be the best 14 minutes uh, that you've spent this month. Um, yeah, and, and she, um, I was hoping that I might have time to read out a letter. She wrote a letter to her younger self, to her 18 year old self. And, uh, and it's beautiful. Um, I will ask Julie if we have time to read it, but if I, we don't, I highly recommend you look it up um, because she, yeah, it's all about telling her younger self not to worry, um, that it's okay, you're gonna have sex, because you know what young teenager is not wondering that I guess and um and telling her that she's going to have a full life and that she just it's going to be okay because as a young disabled person um Stella was afraid of how how is she going to live how would she move to Melbourne which was her dream but um she connected to another disabled person with her own condition with her the same um dodgy bones and um this person was a mentor for her so she moved to Melbourne and 
This poem also, this, well, this letter that she writes also talks to her about disability pride and says, you know, the most important thing you need to do is to, um, well, she mentions a book called Pride and Prejudice. No, Pride Without Prejudice, a book written in the 80s about disability. Amazing. Um, I've just read it by osmosis. I haven't actually read the words because I'm not a reader, but I know it's amazing. Um, and she also says, go and find Laura Hershey, um, which was the, the person we mentioned two women ago. And, um, and she tells her to be proud. She says, just ignore all those voices telling you that disability is a bad thing. It's not. Um, this is a poem that I think all disabled people could read and find strength from. Um, yeah, uh, she ends that poem by saying, she ends that letter by saying, the journey towards disability pride is long and hard and you have to practice every single day. And I think that is, winds up my um, presentation. Oh. Thank you. This is the, uh, the Disability Pride mural in, uh, was it in Brunswick? Yeah, so this one is right in the centre of town. It's in the CBD. You haven't seen it yet, Julie? Uh, no, I haven't seen this one. Uh, I, I saw the images of the Brunswick one. Yeah, but so this was, this, one. Done, this was done last year. Um, so it was commissioned by the City of Melbourne uh, 2021. It, uh, it was a six-month project. took me like almost two years because crypt time and COVID time. Um, things take much longer. We operate in our own time frame when we have live with disability. Anyway, so this is a mural. This is only a small section of it. It's actually on both sides of the street. It's in Royal Lane, which is right near the, um, the Town Hall and the Burke Street Mall. So it's just off Burke Street, right near the corner of Swanson and Burke Street. So next time you're in the city, Julie, you can't oh, miss it. I'm, um, I'm, writing, I'm writing these details now. And yeah. you have mentioned to me, I don't go to the, into the city that much. That's okay. So, yeah, so I, I've, I've written it down again because I, I, I need to go in there and have a look. Um, yeah. Most of the workplace things coming up in the city, so I think I'll pop in and have a good look at it. So, so I wanted to make this mural to create a space in the city where people could go and feel like they belong. Like, you know, often when you walk through the city as a disabled person, particularly if you're physically, you know, uh, visibly disabled, um, it's it doesn't feel comfortable. You know, uh, there's there's barriers. It's, it's difficult to get around. There's attitudes. Um, and so this is a space where I feel like you can be with your ancestors and your elders. Um, uh, there's, a, it's, there's many parts to this mural and there's a, just a different view of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Let me um, get out because I know that oh, there's me. Yeah, well, we, we, we went over, over time a bit, but I think it was worth worthwhile. So um, thank you, Larissa, for your um, presentation because uh, it's good for accessibility because we all can't get it, get to the city and, you know, have a look at things physically. So it was a really good rundown of the disability history of uh, ancestry. On that note, um, uh, yeah, we'll see you back here in, in two weeks' time. Bye. Catch us on Your Life, Your Voice YouTube channel live every Monday fortnight or on demand. We would like your comments and suggestions on topics that you would like us to explore. Leave your comments on YouTube comment section. Please feel free to email us on dndyourlifeyourvoice at gmail.com or Contact us via the Migrant Resource Centre Northwest Region, Inc. Phone number 1300 676 
Diversity and Disability is a project of the Market Resource Centre North West Region Incorporated and would like to thank the management for funding this project, especially living through the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has been difficult for people with disabilities living in isolation.